You are now listening to the second podcast with. Who? Craig Jones. Who? Craig Jones. <laughs> And um, uh, having that guy around is the best thing that ever happened for the squad. Welcome back to the El Segundo podcast. We're going to kick this one off. We're going to talk about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. This man has been in the news nonstop. It took a Titanic submarine and a Russian coup to get this guy out of the headlines. But we need to talk about why he's been dominating the headlines. And of course, it's because of the Joe Rogan podcast he was on. But let's give some perspective to his family. Um, so the legendary family he's from. JFK, one of the most beloved political figures in American history. Obviously, the president that was assassinated. He was a civil rights leader. He helped kick off the space race. And he averted us from nuclear war when those nukes were in Cuba and he chose not to invade. He also, strangely, uh, he invaded Vietnam when it was still a popular decision to do so. So obviously a real American legend, probably most people's, most people's only president they know yeah. from history. Um, but yeah, he was, a, he was a handsome man, a good speaker. And now we get to his brother, Robert F. Kennedy, not just his brother, in fact, his Eskimo brother too. Robert F. Kennedy was the youngest attorney general in American history. That's an achievement, despite the fact that his own brother gave him the job, but let's forget about that. When he was attorney general, he helped take down um, organized crime in America. He went after Jimmy Hoffa. He helped kill the American mafia. And really all that we're left with today is the Sopranos. I was more of a Godfather fan myself. But we get onto his son. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. So again, JFK, civil rights leader. Robert F. Kennedy took down the mafia. And now we have RFK Jr. here to take down Wi-Fi. The family has no limits in what it can attack, what it can help bring down in its ability to change American history. But what's beautiful about this is every time Rogan has a guest on, a, get, a controversial guest, a guest of this caliber, it helps remind remind the whole jiu-jitsu community how blessed we are. Because not only do we have incredible athletes in our sport, we have absolute experts in medical science, uh, social welfare, political science, and strangely enough, in ancient history of Egypt and sort of uh, long lost societies. But again, we, we are blessed that we don't just have incredible athletes, but we have some of the smartest people in the world doing jiu-jitsu. And all you have to do is go on social media after a, after a podcast like this, and it's just, you're just reminded of how lucky we are. What a fucking sport we're in, huh? Yeah, it's a blessed sport. I mean, you don't, even, you don't have to turn on the news. You don't have to read a book. You don't have to do any research of your own whatsoever. You don't even need to hit Google. Just go on social media and check some stories from time to time. You're going to learn yourself a very nice lesson about things in America and really around the world. Every single time Rogan has a guest on like this, we are reminded how blessed we are in the jiu-jitsu community. Because of course, we don't just have incredible athletes in this sport, at the top of the sport. We don't even just have incredibly smart black belts running academies. We have experts in not just medical science, but social welfare economics, and strangely, the long lost civilizations of ancient Egypt. Basically, the people in this sport can do it all. And that's something I don't think many sports have experts in all these fields. But talking, um, talking about what RFK Jr. is, and he's really like, um, we've heard it for a long time, vaccines cause autism. And again, I think given the sport I'm in with such a high density of people with autism, I think it probably makes us somewhat of a, what of an expert in this field. Yeah, we should have a study ran on these jiu-jitsu guys for sure. Yeah, I mean, like I, I made a video recently where I've been trying to test the theory. I mean, again, you take a vaccine, you're more likely to have autism. I have recently taken, uh, I said nine shots, I meant 10 shots. We tried all the vaccines, despite, again, despite my best efforts, still no autism. I might be taking the wrong ones though, but yeah, these are mostly COVID based. But yeah, RFK, firm believer 
that as vaccines have gone up, autism's gone up too. But again, I want to get to the science on that because if we can really prove that vaccines cause autism, then uh, that's a protocol I'm going to put my jiu-jitsu team on because we've seen, we know teams out there that are recruiting 14 year old Brazilians and they're just giving them a strict protocol on PEDs. Obviously we do that here at B team, but we're always looking for an edge. And if I have to vaccinate these guys multiple times as well, just to increase the levels of autism, I think that's gonna be massive. It's gonna take us from the B team all the way up to the A team. Or all the way down to the D team. All the way down to the D team. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure what size penises autistic people are packing, but um, I'm happy to show you mine later. Uh, yeah, but I think uh, RFK Jr., he throws out some wild theories, eh? But I mean, it is pure entertainment. And one thing I do want to point out is here on the podcast, El Segundo, we do get a lot of criticism about our audio quality, but I would say uh, you see problems with podcasts of all budgets with audio quality, and clearly we were hearing a bit of distortion in Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s microphone there. Yeah, uh, Jamie from JRE is going to have to look into that for sure. Yeah, I would suggest they definitely sort that out because you don't want that in the YouTube comments. You hear nothing about audio quality. That's something they talk about nonstop. Um, but yeah, obviously, yeah, RFK Jr. I mean, it brings me to another thing, and this is a this is a tragedy that's happened in the sport right now. So we got a uh, Chris Lencioni. His name, his nickname's Sunshine. Sunshine. Bellator fighter, right? And he, I'll sort of give a bit of context to who he is, right? So Chris is beloved in the jiu-jitsu community because he had an MMA fight against AJ Agazam, mm -hmm. and he beat up AJ a bit. Pretty Again, young. I'll say AJ survived that beating. AJ, tough as nails, he's very hard to uh, hard to submit, but he took a bit of a beating in that fight. Lencioni is a guy that loves to talk a bit of shit. He's always talking, he'll talk to the fight, talk to the press conference, even grappling matches, he's talking smack. He loves loves a bit of banter out there. But yeah, he was able to beat AJ Agazan. He had a massive fight booked coming up. So James Gallagher is sort of uh, McGregor's teammate. One of McGregor's most marketable teammates too. Gallagher gets a ton of press yeah. in Bellator. He's Big sort Bellator of, guy. Yeah, Bellator love him. He draws the numbers in for Bellator. So Chris Lencioni had been rewarded with such a big fight. Chris is a guy that uh, I've trained with him. He came down to Puerto Rico and trained with us when I was still part of the uh, part of the DDS. So yeah, we got to spend some time, got to roll with him a bit. He is a nice guy. He's a cool guy. He talks he talks some shit, but at the end of the day, he's a nice guy. He's a good good guy. And something tragic happened recently, right? He was training in Oregon, right? And I only heard about this because of Chael Sonnen's Instagram post. Because me, I'm a big, I'm a big Reddit guy. I'm spending a lot of time on Reddit, looking at the forums and stuff. Uh, and I saw Chael Sonnen posted a picture of Lencioni, and I didn't even know what it was about. You know, you see a, uh, you see a, whenever I see someone posting a photo with their kids and stuff, usually you just fucking you scroll, scroll past that right boring shit, it. you know, like. <laughs> You're following a hot chick, she puts up a photo, pregnant, bang, unfollow immediately, you know? That stuff, I'm on Instagram for a laugh. That's that's not really doing it for me. So I didn't look into the post, um, but then I did see, and again, we would have heard about this because Reddit actually did a blackout. So Reddit, uh, they were pro the subreddits were protesting something on there where uh, Reddit was about to start charging third-party apps. I honestly don't even know what this was about. So all the subreddits went dark, so they just disappeared for a while. And you can say what you will about Reddit. It's a great source of uh, news, and it's a great place to see people commenting shit back and forth on news articles. This story is something that uh, would have made a made waves on Reddit, but again, it was blacked out at the time. And like I said, I saw Chael Sonnen post, but I didn't really read it. I ended up seeing Sonnen posted on his story and I read into it. So Lencioni was training in Oregon. That's the connection. He lives in Oregon. Mm -hmm. That's the connection he has to Chael Sonnen. Chael's the gangster of Westland, yep. Oregon. Uh, also our first podcast guest, but he posted, Lencioni was training. I think he was visiting a new team. He was getting some MMA training in just completely collapsed and went into cardiac arrest. And this was over a week ago now. So I heard about it a week after it happened. So Chris, he has a young daughter or son, I believe he has one kid and he has his wife and his wife's posting about this on Instagram as we speak. But she basically said, yeah, he went into cardiac arrest. There were some reports out there saying he had gone into a coma, but he, he's not in a coma. I remember reading something strange about how he can respond to them when they tell him to blink. So he's 
he's collapsed in training, not in a submission, he hasn't been hit in the head. Hor scary, obviously super scary things happen. And now he's in the ICU. And uh, as far as I know, yeah, it's not a coma. I just don't think he can control his body or anything. But oh, apparently, fine. if he can respond to blinks, I believe that means he's obviously still, he's still conscious within there, there which yeah. is uh, s s terrifying. He has a GoFundMe up to, to help cost, uh, the medical costs of his family and stuff. So obviously, go donate to that. But it's just, it's particularly tragic because he has he he has a great MMA career and getting a fight against a guy like James Gallagher. So this probably couldn't happen at a worse time. Yeah, so yeah. That's that been definitely the main event. Biggest fight in his career for sure. Biggest fight in his career, yeah. So very tragic. But what's crazy about it is, Chris, what, he's you know the type of guy that. What's weird about the vaccine stuff is you can usually distinguish by looking at a person what their feelings are on the vaccine, strangely, or even a quick conversation with them, or maybe even what podcasts they're listening to, you can quickly distinguish if they're a pro-vaccine guy or anti-vaccine guy. Um, I mean, most people are kind of indifferent to it. I yeah. feel like that's probably the, the right response. I mean, if you're, not a, if you're not a scientist, I don't know how you're arguing too strong either way, but Chris was a guy that he was an anti-vax guy. He never took the vaccine, but he's a young guy, an athlete who went into cardiac arrest. So everyone jumps on his posts and argues with his wife saying, oh, he must have had the vaccine. And his wife's like, no, he didn't have the vaccine. And the guy's are like abusing his wife on there being like, no, he lied to you or you are lying to us to try to get money and stuff like this. Absolutely insane behavior out of these out of these guys on this Instagram post day. Eh? And it's weird. So I think it's, pre it's pretty reflective of uh, definitely the jiu-jitsu community, MMA community as well. Like it's like uh, everyone sort of fits the same bill, you know, like so. they listen, they, they listen. It used to be your friend used to send you a YouTube documentary late at night. I remember when I was younger, I used to watch the conspiracy documentaries. You'd watch one of them and you'd be like, bang, I can prove the Twin Towers was the inside job. You feel very strongly about it. Nowadays, guys will listen to my podcast and they'll think they know more than the world leaders on all these things and stuff. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm for or against it. I'm just saying it's crazy for some random dude that maybe works at Home Depot to be arguing with the wife of a guy that's just had a heart attack yeah. about how it was the vaccine that his wife's saying he didn't take. I don't know. It's, it's crazy to me. It's yeah. mind blowing. It's fucking lunatics, man. It's fucking. It's his wife, you know. Yeah, your wife. Literally arguing and abusing. I'm, I went back recently. I saw she had deleted some of the comments and stuff. But yeah, imagine, imagine to be in her position. Your husband, the father of your child, just had a cardiac sort of episode training. And you're having to spend your time trying to get money to raise money for the medical costs. Mm. But you're, you're arguing with absolute lunatics at the, at the exact same time. So yeah, I mean, that's like, to me, that's twice the tragedy there. Not yeah. only she lost him but she was arguing with some of the dumbest human beings on earth. Yeah. I mean, if you want to argue vaccines, uh, you, it's probably not the place. <laughs> no. no, Chris is a fucking super nice guy, runs the kids program over there as well, as far as being the pro fighter. He do, he's a, couldn't happen to like a, a nicer guy for sure. Yeah, absolute, absolute tragedy. Hope. I mean, I think it's been close to two weeks now. Fuck. But again, most people didn't hear about it because like uh, Reddit is a source of news for a lot of people and it would have been on the Reddit MMA forums. It would have even been on Sorry, subreddits. We've even been on the uh, Reddit BJJ subreddits again because he has competed in a lot of jiu-jitsu tournaments. Yeah. He competed in Chael Sonnen's Submission Underground, Combat Jiu-Jitsu, I believe, regular. Yeah. He EBI. was there when you fought uh, Cowboy. Yep, yep, he was there. Him and Jordan Holly were talking a lot of shit to <laughs> each other, which is a funny event. But yeah, Chris, Chris was, uh, yeah, he was, he was a good grappler. He is a good grappler and a good grappler for an MMA guy too, testing himself in both role sets but yeah i'm not sure what the uh, prognosis is but that's that's definitely definitely scary i won't say who it was i remember uh oh, i can't say his name here but i was training i won't even say where i'm training because it might give some hints away one of the guys i was training with um he's he's in the front head i'm not i don't have him in the front head someone else has i'm watching him train he's just showing up to training that day this guy has him in a front le front head and the guy just passes out so the, the guy is in the front head yeah. but not in a choke just. and he collapses on the ground and then wakes back up and we're telling him we're like hey bro you just passed out maybe go see a doctor 
And this person was insisting that the other guy had choked him unconscious and we were just lying to him. We were just joking around with him. So imagine like a room, there was like what five to 10 fuck? of us in there being like, hey man, you just randomly collapsed during a roll. Maybe see a doctor? And he's just like, no, no, no. You must have put me to sleep. You guys are just fucking with me. We, I mean, we know I'm a big fan yeah. of fucking with people, but I, I don't think I could ever, I could ever go that far to fuck with someone over a medical issue. Ultimately, after like 30 minutes of being like, are you okay, are you okay? He, he started to believe us that yeah, maybe he did pass out. But I remember him being like, nah, it's probably just jet lag, man. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't think you just fucking had a power nap, bro. I think you fucking. You just wake up and you still wanted to keep banging, or what? He just like I'm. He rested for it? a bit, thinking he had just been choked unconscious, yeah. and then he yeah he got back in, came back to lunch training that day. What the fuck? It, yeah, it's wild. It's wild how people will have a clear medical problem and just like or a potential medical problem and kind of like ignore, you know what I mean? Ignore it. Like obviously you. Freddie is the shakiest cameraman on earth, but he just tells me. I mean, I don't know. He maybe has a crack addiction or something. I definitely don't drink enough caffeine for it, but we're going to have to do a blood we'll get, test and yeah. we'll find out. We're going to sure. get to the bottom of this. Even if I have to pay for his medical test, we're going to find out why he has the shakes. Because, I mean, it might be... Because when I roll him, he shakes, but that might just be fear. I'm not sure. But it does feel like he's tapping the whole time. It's either fear or excitement. I'm not sure. Myself. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a bit of sexual Dude, arousal. If in that you thing. see my hand, you can zoom in here when I edit this. Dude, that's perfect. Perfectly still. Oh, you could <laughs> you could be a surgeon, eh? Oh fuck. Yeah, I don't know. I've always been. Uh, I've always had a pretty shaky hand, but I've had blood tests before. I'm a fucking specimen of a man, so I think I'm all right. You're you're a specimen of the shakes, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, all right, guys. Obviously, Freddie's probably going to die. He's just shaking all the time. Um, we'll edit this out if he does die. Uh, guys, we've got we to gotta bring it back to the, the politics of COVID and vaccines. I don't know if jiu-jitsu community is much more politically engaged uh, and aggressive on social media than other communities. I honestly don't know. I think because Rogan has gifted us a ton of people to this sport. Obviously, there's gonna be a lot of Rogan type guys in, uh, in our community. You know, overwhelmingly, most of the people in the sport got involved in it because of Rogan or the UFC. Um, so obviously, they're gonna share a lot of beliefs because they're listeners of the podcast. But I mean, even for me, like I flip back and forth. Like I used to be a big mask guy. Once I got my veneers though, I became very anti-mask. I will say this. A lot of guys that didn't get the vaccine, you know I'm talking about, you're talking about your average single dad. These guys act like because they didn't get the vaccine, they're basically the modern day Rosa Parks. Like they take great pride in not being vaccinated. But what's funny about that exact guy that takes a lot of pride in not being vaccinated, you put a vaccine in a syringe, big fan, uh, he hates it. Absolutely hates it. You put steroids in that syringe, he suddenly becomes a big fan. So I think, just like people are having teeth problems, so what do we do? We put fluoride in the waters. I think we're gonna have to slowly sneak little bits of vaccine into their steroid injections. We'll sort of like sneak it in there and they'll absolutely love continuing to get those injections. I think that's the only solution we really have here. If we can't give it to them because they've listened to too many podcasts, we'll sneak into their steroids. That's how we'll get them. To me, like Rosa Parks famously said on that bus, Nah, bro. I'm good. We're talking about podcasts. Obviously, um, really, the world is a much better place since podcasts have came about. They've cut out a lot of the uh, unnecessary middlemen of knowledge and information, really. Like, I know when I was growing up, you, you had to go to university. You had to go to college. God forbid, even, you had to, uh, had to read a book. Now we have the entire world's knowledge gifted to us through just podcast hosts. And we can listen to that on the way to wherever we need to go, on the way to work, on the way to school. But again, obviously if you're listening to a podcast, why would you go to school? You're already learning everything you need to learn about the world. But podcasts have started a lot of trends, right? But I wanna give a shout out to an OG a guy that was really, uh, he was 
ahead of the curve on a lot of these trends. He was doing these things before Rogan, Huberman, even Wim Hof, and that is the legend of the Gracie family, Hicks and Gracie. Hicks and Gracie was uh, doing cold baths before podcasts were even invented. He was doing breath work before Wim Hof. And I really, what I'm most respecting for, he was doing yoga before yoga pants had even been invented or even uh, culturally accepted to just be out and about in. Yeah. I think I respect him the most for teaching the Hulk his breathing uh, techniques in the fucking first Hulk movie. That's true. He, taught, uh, he featured in the Hulk movie, the one with Edward Norton, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that was fucking sick. He does his crazy breath work uh, with his ribs moving and yeah. stuff. Corn Gracie, Corn Gracie does that as well. But Hickson was kind of the uh, the undefeated legend of the Gracie family. Sadly, never faced Sakuraba. Sakuraba was able to take out a few of the family members, but uh, that match never came about. I believe at the time negotiations were going down. I think uh, Hickson suffered a family tragedy, and uh, they really couldn't put it together. But that would have been maybe of the '90s or early 2000s, the biggest MMA yeah. fight you could possibly imagine. Japan versus Brazil was massive, was massive. Um, but yeah, Hicks and Gracie, incredible. I remember he came to Australia and he would be doing seminars and it'd be, uh, two, he, he would have 200 person seminars, Jeez. you know, basically 200 person minimums. And he would, he could charge, he could honestly charge whatever he wanted for those and they would, they would sell out straight away. I sadly was out of town at the time. He came to Absolute, Absolute MMA and Collingwood brought in Hicks and Grace. I think we had um, we had like 200 people there. But yeah, crazy. I remember hearing stories back in the day like, and this is bold, this is really bold to do this. I would never, I would never in a million years do this. I would never have the confidence. But I remember Hickson would be traveling the world and sometimes even do it with high level competitors in the room. He'd be like, he'd, he'd be like, I'm gonna demonstrate my mount escape. And he would go in the room and he'd pick out the best guys in the room to take mount on him. And then wow. he'd, he'd, I remember what, the, the rumor is he did it with Cabrinho one time. I'm not sure what ultimately happened, but uh, I would love to get to the bottom of that story. But yeah, I mean, that's brave. I'm not confident in any single one of my techniques that I would ever just be like, all right, there's 200 people here, there's cameras out. Someone take mount on me, I'm gonna get out. What a fucking legend. I actually remember, I heard a story, hopefully Hoist Gracie doesn't kill me. Hoist Gracie, I did do Hoist Gracie seminars uh, coming up way back, like 2008, 2009, I was doing Hoist seminars in uh, Adelaide, Australia. But Northern England, obviously catch wrestling um, is huge in England. Billy Robertson and stuff like that. And there was, uh, Chris Thompson is a guy, he runs Grapple Fest and Chris, big catch wrestling guy, he's got a coach called Darren. Darren's this absolutely monstrous human being, huge. And Darren, I think he's a judo black belt, but he's originally a catch guy. Um, I'm sure someone's given him a jiu-jitsu black belt by now, but this is one of the biggest, scariest looking people I've ever seen. He used to train with uh, Rico Rodriguez back in the day, I remember when Rico was preparing for ADCC, because Darren was like, uh, he was crazy, he was crazy. He was a wrestler, he had submissions, fucking terrifying guy. He'd be, have to be in his 50s now and still, absolutely terrifying but I remember Darren telling me a story about how Hoist Gracie was passing through doing seminars and he was like did a seminar at a school nearby and Darren was there again Darren for perspective at the time I imagine he was a similar size he's still over 100 kilos still well over 220 pounds and like, he must be at least 6'3 so just for perspective he looks like a henchman in snatch and to be honest i don't know what his life story is but that might be his career path he might actually be a proper british gangster chris thompson certainly looks like one um but they go to a hoist seminar and hoist is picking people out of the crowd he's like i'll show you how to escape psych control and he picks this darren guy out oh he picked darren actually. and then he can't get out of psych control <laughs> and then afterwards he gave darren a blue belt oh fuck that's a good way to get your blue belt for sure. But yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly, that's what would happen to me. You know, like I, I would pick someone out that just happens to be really good. I mean, Hoist should have known, like that guy's fucking massive. But yeah, just for perspective, like that guy used to train with Rico Rodriguez. I remember I went with Chris, right? So like I was before the Jake Shields match. So I'm, I'm friends with Chris. I've been visiting him in Spain. Uh, he lives in Spain now. He used to live in Liverpool. I went up there and I was, 
cutting weight for a Jake Shields match because that was at the time it was like a middleweight match. I was still a lot lighter then. So I land in England. I'm having to cut a ton of weight. We catch the train up to Liverpool and Chris is like, it's the middle of winter. It's fucking freezing cold. And when you cut in weight, everything feels 10 times colder than it is. Like you're just shivering all the time and shit. So already miserable ass England. And then we're heading to Northern England where it's colder again. I show up to train at this gym and this is where I meet uh, Darren. And I show up to this gym and it's a gym of people that look just like that. Awesome. And I'm here I am thinking, oh, cut weight, just get a little sweat going. And it's a gym full of these fucking massive, scary looking monsters. And they were, like this gym was freezing cold. And I don't know, for people that have traveled through England, they have some of the shittiest fucking showers I've ever seen in my life. Like it's a complicated contraption in most of these like commercial places where it's like you're trying to fucking swing knobs and shit. Like honestly, it's, it's confusing to figure out. So here I am like being like, oh, I'm cutting weight. We'll go have a couple rolls. We'll get a sweat out. And then it's just like basically straight out of lock, stock and two smoking barrels, the fucking henchmen in there. They look like Lee Murray's crew, you know? And I'm rolling with these guys, freezing cold, Northern England. They are cool guys, but definitely fucking terrifying to look at. But that's sort of perspective. I heard that story. Not that I was ever that confident to begin with that I'd be like, hey, let me demonstrate this move. Fully resist in front of everyone, you know? But that's the story of how Darren, catch wrestling guy, got his blue belt. And again, I've never been back to Northern England because I make, uh, first of all, it's Northern England. You know what I mean? What's, what's drawing you there? You know, that's what my ancestors were sent away from. But <laughs> I make a lot of catch wrestling jokes and uh, they are catch wrestlers. And, and generally speaking, like, I said to, like we said to Josh Barnett, catch wrestling guys don't have a great fucking sense of humor. You know, British guys are funny about a lot of things, but you pick on a British guy about catch wrestling, you're gonna fucking hear about it. And again, I'm waiting for Darren to be at least 15 years older before I return, return back to that region of the world. But yeah, well, that's what obviously we came about. We're talking about Hoist Gracie and stuff. Yeah, but Hickson, mythical sort of figure in the sport. Hey, Hickson by armbar, you know, like just, just a crazy guy to think about. Like we were talking about, uh, Hicks and Gracie had the documentary, and I'm trying to remember what year it came out. Was it? It would have been like '96. 96, 96, I think so. '96 around then. Yeah, when I first saw Hicks and Gracie ch choke, when I saw the title, you saw a DVD title called Choke. I remember at first I thought it was about the Green River Killer. Then obviously we learned it was about uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu. But that documentary was so cool, and that's what helped create the myth. You know, like p certain people in the sport MMA, they have a myth around them, and it's almost you don't want to be overexposed. Anyone that's overexposed, saturated to the community, the myth's kind of gone. You know, like if you think of the people, Fedor, he'd be one of yeah. those guys. Sakuraba, there's not tons of content about him. So really Hicks and Gracie, like, we have Hicks and Gracie choke. He went on the Rogan podcast. We have his book, but there's really not a lot. I mean, yeah. maybe in Brazilian media there is, but like it's, it sort of cultivates this mythical figure and always the rumor like how he'd never lost like he was 400 and zero all these things helped create the myth of a character but uh obviously yeah we're talking about hickson because he just announced that he actually has parkinson's i think uh he did an interview with kira gracie um and he said he's been suffering it for two years mm -hmm. but he was he seemed in pretty pretty good spirits about it yeah he talked very like a positive light about it like yeah well, yes, yeah, it's, it's tragic. It's a, I mean, again, it reminds me, obviously, Marcelo Garcia battling cancer right now, too. It's like oh, some, of the, some of the heroes of the sport suffering right now. But yeah, again, Hicks and Gracie is like a myth in the sport. Like every single person that does jiu-jitsu pretty much knows who Hicks and Gracie is. He has like an aura around him. And that definitely is very well-deserved considering his contributions to the sport. Um, yeah, he really... Really sad times for sure. Yeah. How incredible would it be if we could have gotten him in the UFC, man? That would have been fucking crazy. That would have been sick, yeah. I mean, it would have been sick just to have him, like, because obviously he had a couple of fights in Pride. He fought against, uh, he started Pride. Pride one was him against a Japanese pro wrestler, Takata, I believe his name is. I'm probably butchering this. We'll edit it afterwards. But yeah, he, yeah, insane. The, like, he was there at the forefront of Pride. And still to this day, a lot of people don't know that the biggest live gate for an MMA event ever. I mean, actually KSW's latest Coliseum event might have rivaled it, but when Bob Sapp versus Noguera 
in Pride, it was 98,000 people. And it was a K1 versus Pride event. So they would have like uh, some Pride fighters do K1 rules. They'd have some K1 fighters do Pride sort of fighting rules. They'd do like Blend It. It'd be a New Year's Eve. Jap New Year's Eve events in Japan used to be the biggest yeah. MMA event in the world. And it's crazy to think 98,000. I think it was, it might've been 2001. So it's like, uh, that was when Pride was at the peak. Obviously sucks, Pride's gone, we're, we're left. This is about all we're left with with Pride these days, unfortunately, keep Jiu Jitsu gay. But yeah, Pride's, uh, Pride was the pinnacle back then. Hicks and Gracie helped, helped build that. Cause it, cause it was so sick, cause it was like we'd already had, Pride started after the UFC. So Hoist Gracie made a name with the American audience. It hugely uh, helped the Gracie name worldwide. Yeah. So then you took Japan's most famous pro wrestler and made him face off against what everyone really considered the best Gracie in the family. And that's that alone birthed Pride. And really Pride's probably still to this day the biggest spectacle anyone's ever seen in MMA. Do you know the numbers of the live gate on um, Israel versus Whitaker one at Marvel Stadium? That must have been massive too. I know I know we had Rousey home, which is around fifty thousand people in Melbourne. I imagine Izzy Whitaker probably similar. Yeah. And Damn, you know, so still blew it out the water. Doubled. Fuck. That's crazy. But yeah, you're talking Bob Sapp versus Noguera. And that fight's crazy because he starts it with a fucking power bomb. Yeah. Just a fucking tombstone like technique on Noguera. Absolutely insane. I miss some of the craziness of that shit, eh? And speaking of craziness, on par with that. Maybe not as athletic, but that would be Elon Musk oh. versus Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg's been training a couple of years. I believe he's a Dave Camarillo guy. A lot of people are good to give Dave Camarillo a shout. I'd love to have him on the podcast one day. He was a great American competitor, yep. hugely influential, runs guerrilla jiu-jitsu. He coordinates, he's done a lot of work with like special forces teams and stuff. He works with the John Wick team. And obviously trains Zuckerberg because he's from the um, from the San Francisco sort of area. So like uh, obviously that's where the tech companies is. That's where Zuckerberg is. Zuck trains though. Zuck's training with Mikey Musumichi. Seen Pretty that. Cool. Yeah. Seen that. They're training wrestling together, which was yeah. mind blowing. So it's cra crazy. It, ta it takes Zuckerberg. It takes fucking Mark Zuckerberg to get <laughs> Mikey Musumichi to do some wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> that's if, fucking incredible. If anyone has the money to get my Kimisa Michi wrestling, I guess it is the Facebook creator, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg. And then obviously Elon Musk. Elon Musk out here with us in Austin now, Texas. I think Elon Musk, his kids train. I've heard, uh, yeah. And I think he did do a few classes back you, in the day. You, you think in like California or? I think so, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, there, I think there's a legit picture of him in a gi. I have to look it up, I'm not sure. But yeah, so it'd be interesting. Elon's a lot bigger than him, weight wise. But yeah, if, <laughs> yeah. I don't think uh, there's, there's not, a chance they would fight but honestly this would jiu-jitsu would be the sport for them because it's basically uh not respecting people's intellectual property and renaming it tech company ceos that's absolutely their field of expertise you know like that's every single one of my instructionals is something i've stolen from someone else rebranded it i have the luxury i mean other people doing the sport i won't name names but if you take someone else's if you take someone with an American accent, I could say the exact same thing with a slightly foreign accent and people would be like, wow, that's incredible, that's breathtaking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not yeah. to mention, if you throw in a twist of a foreign language or something, bang, you do sound smarter with an accent. Americans love an accent, but it has a cutoff point. Because if that accent hits the point where they don't know what you're saying, they'll still find you attractive, but they won't obviously know what you're saying in any capacity. All right, so we should break this. We should try to break this potential fight down. Right, I say that. I mean, it started as a grappling match challenge, turned into a fight. Elon seems like that guy, though. He's like, hey, I'm not going to take any rules in this. I'm just going to see red. I don't think Elon would actually even train for it, to be honest. I think he just feels confident that he could take Zuckerberg in a fight. Which again, you don't don't blame him, but Zuckerberg is is competing, yeah. competing in events in uh, San Francisco. Um, but I honestly feel like if these guys fought, it would be like when artificial intelligence, you know, like first they had, they created an AI that could beat a chess, a real chess player. But this would be like AI versus AI, like these guys going at it. That would be basically like two computers facing off in a chess match. But 
it would be entertaining. I just don't know why, like, they would do it. Like, they're talking to cool and Dana White about it. Like, why do they want to do this in the UFC? They could just do it on their own platforms and stuff, which is... I wonder, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I have no idea. In the metaverse or something? Yeah, they want Dana White to mediate it. I reckon they should do, like, a pink slips match. Like, if Elon loses, he deletes Twitter. If Zuckerberg loses, he deletes Facebook. But it would be the most watched most watched fight ever for sure you think so more than like I mean definitely more than like Connor or fucking Mayweather and shit but easily easily jeez this would be so good a spectacle I reckon the mo I mean they should just have a boxing match you know like I don't know like I want to see like a celebrity boxing version of it because if I'm picturing an MMA fight I'm honestly thinking like to correct me if I'm wrong here but uh, if I see if I if I picture Zuckerberg Elon Musk fighting I'm picturing biting <laughs> Scratching, hair pulling. That's the type of yeah. fight I envision, but that's why I think these guys should just glove up and jump in the boxing ring. In all seriousness, it's happen they want it to happen in Vegas. Would a commission even fucking sign off on that? No training for these guys? I reckon, I reckon yeah. I mean, any ca just based on how much revenue that would bring to the city that signed off on it, I think that it would be worth the risk of one of them dying in this fight. Again, Who's to say one's dangerous enough to kill the other? That's true. You know what I mean? This would be like uh, two guys with inflatable boxing gloves. It's like, no matter how many times you hit, it's not going to do any damage. Yeah, you got like uh, fucking Elon <clears throat> pushing 200. He's a big guy. You know, Zuck, smaller. So he looks like he was like Mikey's size, maybe at 10 pounds on him or something. Yeah, he's a big size. I think Elon's 200 at least. <sighs> Fuck. And yeah. then uh, Zuckerberg looks probably like, yeah, 150 max. But yeah, it is a funny one. It'd be fucking sick if they just got juiced out of their minds. You know what I mean? <laughs> just like jacks. Like, Zuck has agreed to it thinking that Elon Musk is going to show up in his current form. But if we know anything about Elon Musk, is he's, he's basically aging like Benjamin Button. The man looked terrible 30 years ago. He looks better, better now. So if he, can, if he can find the same steroid doctors that he found plastic surgeons, I think Zuckerberg's fucked. Yeah. This would be sick. I don't know, like a co-main, you have uh, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates. Bro. Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates. Be... Bezos looks Bezos like Bezos is pretty in good shape. Pretty eh? jacked, yeah. He's on, he's on some good sauce for sure. <clears throat> yeah, Be Bezos, I mean, he had the world's biggest divorce settlement, and that definitely motivated him like <laughs> the most single man in American history, you know? Yeah. Guys, I'm not going to pick a winner in this, uh, in this potential fight, in this potential match. Um, I would love to see what the odds makers have it as if it was going to happen. But, I mean, it is, it is incredibly, incredibly entertaining. Um, if there's one CEO of a company that I think would be absolutely fearless, and fe being fearless goes a long way, that would be the guy that was in the Titanic sub. I think that's a guy with no quit. I don't think he's tapping when he gets choked. You know what I mean? I'd put my money on him over a lot of these other, other CEOs. But Zuck, Elon, these are guys that really, um, it segues me into my next topic. These are guys that should probably have weapons to defend themselves, you know? Like, I mean, again, they're gonna be able to pay for bodyguards and shit. But if those bodyguards were to have weapons, I'd recommend those weapons be staccato. Staccato, the world's best handgun. I only learned about staccato because I went shooting with Alex Jones. Alex Jones hit me up to go shoot some guns with him. We went out to his, uh, we went out to his private ranch out towards, actually it was where we were shooting, I was shooting guns the other day. I won't say the area, but it's, let's just say the direction is west, right? So I went out shooting with Alex Jones. He had a broad array of weapons. We got the full rich guy treatment, you know, like we're not putting, we're not loading any of our weapons. We're being handed loaded guns and they're talking us through how to shoot it. But, Alex Jones was making 100 yard shots with a handgun. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I was like, this guy's a trained killer. But then he was breaking down the weapon he had, staccato, Texas made handgun. Believe it or not, actually, the, I believe they originally designed the original John Wick handguns. Oh, yeah. But staccato's crazy low recoil. As far as I know, it's, a, uh, it's not a 1911. It's a variation that they created called a 2011. But yeah, incredible gun. It's one of those things that it looks and feels very expensive. But we got to go shooting with these guys. Um, so again, yeah, I obviously I shot the staccato with Alex Jones. I tried to buy myself a staccato soon afterwards. And I remember I was texting Alex Jones being like, hey, 
which staccato should I buy? And his words were, you can buy a little one or a big one. And I was like, thanks for the incredible technical <laughs> breakdown, Alex. Uh, so I go to try buy a staccato, but I don't know if I should say this on podcast because I don't know if the um, DMV will be on to me about this, but in Texas, all you need to driver's license to buy a gun. My driver's license, the address is out of date. It's, the address is not out of date, so the address is incorrect. It's my old address. And if your address is incorrect, you can't buy a gun because your, your, your license is technically no good, right? Mm -hmm. But I went, so I went to the DMV. Texas does not honor Australian licenses. Uh, they have a reciprocal program. If Australia honored Texas licenses, Texas would honor Australian ones. They don't. So I go into the DMV. I talk to the person behind the desk. The person goes, hey, you got to do a driving test. I'll take your photos. I'll do all of everything else. And uh, you just bring back in the driving test when it's done. Show it to me, and then we'll ship you out your driver's license. So I'm like, oh, fuck, great. I have to do a driving test. One week later, a driver's license shows up in my, in my mailbox. And I'm like, I was like, what the fuck is this? And they accidentally sent me a driver's driver's license. However, since then I've moved house and when I tried to change my address online, it said return to the DMV. So obviously they're on to me. They know my driver's license uh, is not good, but I'm driving around with a driver's license with a bad address. But that of course meant when I tried to buy my staccato over a year ago, the guy was like, sorry, this address is wrong. You can't buy it. I gave it a couple cracks, tried to do some dodgy shit. Didn't get the staccato in the end. That was the last I had thought about Staccato for a while, and then we had a connection through one of your friends. Yeah, Doug, shout out Doug, man, thank you. Thanks to Doug. Um, so we trained, we trained with some Navy guys, they came down, we did some work with them, and then we went out to the shooting range one day, and uh, the Staccato guys came down there, they came down with the whole range of the Staccato yeah. handguns um, and a bunch of ammunition for us, and they were showing us some shooting tactics, and also like, we just got to try them all, like, and again, if you're not a gun person, this is not gonna make much sense to you, but like, even the Navy guys were like, this is like the fucking Rolls yeah. Royce of handguns. Yeah, absolutely incredible. There's like, uh, they just got very little recoil. So like, we've, they feel like great to shoot. So we were hanging out with Staccato guys. They were telling me, one of them was telling me, he's like, man, you can make a 200 yard shot with this. So that's now my goal in life is to be able to get good enough at shooting to be able to double Alex Jones's 100 yard shot. But yeah, Staccato, awesome, uh, awesome to work with. I'm hoping to buy the entire collection. Yeah. I'm a guy that'll buy guns, but be too lazy to actually go to the range and shoot them. Did you shoot all of them there, or did you, did, yeah, all of them? Which one's I your favorite? I shot the C, the P, the XC, and the XL. Um, Seth behind the camera there was a big fan of the C. He's a fan of very small handguns. Uh, us men, on the other hand, we really, we really enjoyed the XL, especially with the compensator on the end. But yeah, hopefully if Staccato hook us up, we're gonna give Seth the uh, the little C and the rest of us will take something a bit bigger, something a bit more girthy, you know? But yeah, the Staccato, man, again, Google this, look this gun up, this gun looks sick. absolutely sick, incredible. And I've only shot a few different types of handguns, but it definitely feels superior to me. It's a gun that if you were gonna get robbed and killed, you, you would appreciate that you were going yeah. in style, you know? Like I wouldn't wanna be shot with no, cheap ass little handgun, at least put me away with something expensive. It's so good. That was Nicky Ryan's first time shooting it, and I think uh, he had one of the fastest times in uh, our little challenge that we had at the end. Yeah, Nicky Ryan was, uh, was a weapon, with a weapon. Um, a little known fact, a lot of people think he left school because he, um, they wanted to take him out of school because they were like, oh, he's gonna pursue a life in uh, jiu-jitsu. But the real fear amongst his friends and family were that like, this guy really does seem like he's gonna shoot up a school. Let's pull it, let's get ahead of the curve. Let's pull him out of there before he can make that come to fruition. And obviously when we saw him, the way he handled that weapon, the way he was able to shoot at those targets, it is, it is a relief that they did pull him out of school and they ended his education early. Um, and again, it's good we weapons train him because obviously he chose a life in jiu-jitsu. That's a very difficult jiu -jitsu, uh, career to make money in. And then he's, he's got the body of Matthew McConaughey from Dallas Bias Club, which the wheels are falling off. So the good thing about weapons training him, in, him is obviously he could go into a, a life of crime, of maybe robbing banks, robbing other people. Like that's, that's really his only other path to making money. Because they robbed him of his education and they put him into jiu-jitsu and now his body's robbing him of his jiu-jitsu career. So really, 
what better thing to do for the kid than to give him an absolute uh, great training program in weapons. And you know what's funny? Nicky Ryan is quite a fragile soul. He's always getting hurt. Hurt his ribs the other day. I was watching him load the bullets into the cartridge and he hurt his thumb. <laughs> and I think we might lose him for about two weeks because of that. Oh, fuck. If they're... Here's Nicky Ryan's future, right? He should work for occupational health and safety because if there is a way for that man to hurt himself, he will find it. He needs to be brought into workplaces, building sites, anywhere he needs to walk over wet floors because, again, if there's a way someone's going to get hurt, it's going to be Nicky Ryan and they could monitor him just going about his day to see, to identify potential hazards because Nicky Ryan is going to find and identify those hazards. <laughs> Nicky, when you see that, I'm sorry for even bringing you up, dude. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, Freddie's fault for getting me on a Nicky Ryan <laughs> tangent. That was good. <laughs> oh, fuck. That was amazing. That's a good time to finish it. What better time to finish a podcast than talking about Nicky Ryan's failed school shooter aspirations? You know, he's probably closer to school shooting than uh, day two of ADCC, but that's, that's a story for another time. What is coming up? I depart tomorrow. Tomorrow is Monday, uh, Austin time. We're flying into the belly of the beast, Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a place where even three days is far too long. I was there for five weeks for, to film Ultimate Fighter with Vox, and that, that took years off my life. And obviously, I don't have too many years left to begin with. But I'll be there from this coming Monday until the UFC, which is, I mean, it's almost two weeks in Vegas. So I'm, honestly, I'm envisioning... We fly out to Vegas, the whole crew's there, Nicky Ryan, um, Nicky Ryan Heist I'm competing too. We fly and we all compete on the Thursday, we'll be training a few days before. I'm envisioning my retirement bender to begin. Hopefully the Fire Pass event finishes pretty early, but maybe Thursday night, 9 p.m., the bender begins, and that will continue right on through until when Volkanovski competes on July 8th against Yair Rodriguez, and then when he wins too, that might be the end of me. You know what I mean? Two victories in a week. I'm going to suffer the consequences for that. But tickets are available. It's a mystery to find where you can buy those tickets because uh, it's at the UFC Apex. I think minimum tickets like 100 bucks to get in there. But yeah, it's going to be a, a very small crowd for this uh, Fight Pass Invitational event. Uh, but that is, again, Thursday night, live on UFC Fight Pass. My, my, my match has no weight division. I remember... They said, what weight do you want to do? I said, hey, I care more about how long this fucking match is going to be than the weight. I give him a 20 pound advantage, but do not make this fucking thing longer than 15 minutes. Uh, those are my only conditions. Yes, yeah, so I think the, the weight's 225. They put it heavyweight though. I'm probably only 205 pounds right now. The whole tournament they've got, Big Dan's fucking 284 yeah. pounds. Jeez. That's a big man, you know? Like I'm staying far away from those people. But yeah, UFC Fight Pass Invitational, Ape, live from the Apex in Las Vegas. And the real show will begin afterwards because it'll be the retirement celebrations, retiring as hopefully number one grappler in the world. Um, as you can see, the autism is slowly starting to take effect. Once your hair starts to go gray, that's when you go Super Saiyan autism. That's Dragon Ball Z references for you. But as you can see, my current condition, victory is guaranteed. No more vaccines necessary, just your typical steroids, which I stop about seven days out. It's good for your cardio. Don't inject too close to the event. That'll drain your cardio, one week out, minimum. And that brings us to the end of this episode of El Segundo Podcast. Please sponsor us. Please give us an opportunity to make an absolute mockery of your brands and your fan base. Email bteam at El Segundo, El Segundo at .com for inquiries. Thank you for listening to the El Segundo Podcast. Don't forget... Fuck Craig Jones.